I'd like to welcome everyone to Are You Ready to Garden? It's a session two today. My name is Bill Lubick I'm with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. I work together with the county, Middlesex County, and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. And we are running a series of videos through the Are You Ready to Garden a WebEx um, sessions, training sessions throughout the next month and a half. Uh, so we'll be on every Thursday evening from 6.30 to about 8, um, talking about gardening and answering your questions, um, getting people up to speed on how to grow their own vegetables and grow their herbs and take care of their gardens. And got a lot of good experts that we'll be visiting with over the next month. Uh, a lot of my colleagues from Rutgers and people that are passionate about growing plants and uh, interesting plants and different things that we can try. Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Brendan Pearsall with us. Uh, Brendan is a recent graduate of Rutgers University, but brings a, a wealth of experience in uh, knowing how to build, and he's an expert craftsman. He um, has a lot of experience in the areas of uh, creation and gardens and uh, able to um, really kind of pull a lot of sustainable concepts together. So he's going to be talking about that and how he actually constructed a amazing garden in his backyard. Um, I, I just want to give a shout out to our supporters, which include the, the County of Middlesex. Uh, thanks to our Middlesex County Freeholders for supporting us and everything we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here as well as Rutgers uh, State University. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brendan because he's going to talk to us about tips for constructing an easy care vegetable garden with raised beds, drip irrigation, and low tunnels for season extension. Um, Brendan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, let me get the video up and running so you can all see me. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Brendan Pearsall, and I'm going to take you through some of my garden and teach a few tips and tricks that you can bring into your own to get uh, more, more growth out of your land space. So let's get started. Um, as Bill said, I'm an agricultural program assistant with Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Middlesex County. I'm a recent graduate of the Agriculture and Food Systems Program at Rutgers. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about my story of gardening, um, I'm an on and off lifelong gardener. And, you know, whenever I've had the land space to do it, I've always made sure to have vegetable plants in the ground. So, um, you know, recently, having graduated, spent a few years working in farming, including uh, starting my own cut flower business last year, I really had the opportunity to, you know, learn about gardening from, from really a farmer's perspective and get a lot more of the plant science background to help kind of inform how I approach gardening. Um, I've been slowly adding on to my home garden year after year, but uh, this year when it started to become clear that uh, COVID-19 was going to be such an issue. Uh, I talked to my wife about making more of an investment and really upgrading our garden. And uh, she said to, to go big and grow big. So that's what we did. We put in a lot of nice improvements. And, um, you know, I, and I've seen that same sort of mentality really play out across the country. Uh, you see a lot of people that are kind of getting into the, you know, the, the COVID garden or the quarantine garden mentality. And, you know, when, when the food supply becomes a little less reliable and getting out to the store is a little more difficult, it's nice to have that right in your backyard and know that, you know, your, your source of food is secure and safe and you know where it's coming from. And uh, also important to us was this was the first year that our daughter was old enough to be involved in our garden. And uh, she's been Mostly a big help. She's she's only pulled up uh, one or two plants completely by the roots. Uh, here you can see her getting the bad plants um, while only slightly crushing a tomato. So that's that that that's very helpful. So just to give you a little overview of what we're going to be covering tonight, I'm going to start by talking about raised beds, the materials and construction that goes into them, growing mediums to fill the inside. Then we're going to talk a little bit about garden infrastructure, including drip irrigation and some animal and pest protection. And then we're going to go into season extension. This includes the use of low tunnels, uh, row covers, um, some early and late planting and succession planting ideas. 
Um, and that's where I'm going to address some issues about the upcoming uh, cold that we're going to have this weekend and maybe a few strategies that can help you save any plants that you already have in the ground. And then afterwards, Bill is uh, going to be on hand to share with us some of his favorite varieties and the, the best tasting proven winners that we uh, grow with Cooperative Extension. So, uh, getting into raised beds, uh, simply put, a raised bed is any garden bed that elevates the growing area above the soil. And that can come in a lot of different forms, uh, be it very lovely landscaped, um, you know, corrugated side, or even just simply uh, something that's mounded up to bring it up above the ground. Um, this comes with a few different advantages. Number one, um, one of the biggest things is being able to customize your growing mix, uh, being able to avoid any contaminants that might be present in your site soil. You can really make sure that you're putting in compost and perlite and vermiculite and a lot of things to really have a good, healthy, fertile growing mix that your plants are really going to thrive in. Raised beds also warm up a lot faster in the spring, so you get earlier germination. When you put those seeds in the ground, uh, a lot of them have temperatures that they need the soil to be in order to germinate. So having the bed warmer a little bit sooner helps your seeds get off and running. Uh, raised beds offer better water regulation than most uh, just in-ground sites. Uh, but by definition, you're going to have better drainage, but also with that custom soil mix that you're using, you know, comes the ability to include a lot of things that help hold on to water when it's a little dry and help water drain out easier if it's raining way too much. And uh, one of, another really nice aspect of raised beds is the potential for accessibility. If you have someone with limited mobility, back or knee pain issues, uh, building a higher raised bed allows people to get involved in gardening that, that might be physically limited from doing so otherwise. And the picture I have here on the right is actually of a wheelchair accessible uh, set of raised beds. And you know that's, that's a great option for someone who really wants to, to be able to garden and, and has mobility issues. Um, so getting a little bit into construction here, um, the, one of the biggest choices you're going to make up front is choosing the material that you want to use for your raised bed. Uh, there's a few different ones here that I'm going to go over some brief details of. Uh, cedar is a perennial favorite for raised beds. It's an attractive, lightweight, rot-resistant material. Um, it's easy to work with. It's a fairly soft wood, so it cuts fairly easy. Downsides is, are that it does tend to be a little bit more expensive. Um, Pressure-treated wood is much more affordable, if not entirely attractive. And um, once upon a time, there were issues with pressure-treated wood and the way that it was treated involving a lot of chemicals like arsenic or cadmium. Um, that's not the case anymore. The, the more modern techniques of pressure-treating wood involve uh, micronized copper, which, you know, while you might get a little bit of that into your soil, that's you know, not too dramatically different than if you were using, say, a copper-based fungicide. It's not something that's really going to soak up into your plants and, and you know, cause be any risk to health. Um, landscaping block, you can make some very beautiful, very attractive hardscaped raised beds. Um, it's incredibly durable. It does tend to be more expensive and requires a certain skill set to be able to work with and make sure you know, that, that you build something lasting. The one thing if you do decide to go with landscaping block is to keep in mind that landscaping block that's made of cement or concrete will have lime in it as an ingredient. And over time, that can leach into your soil. And while that isn't dangerous by any means, it can increase the pH of your soil to a point where it could affect your plant's ability to grow there. So if you're gonna use landscaping block, Make sure to test your soil every year or two, and uh, if you see the pH starting to climb up, you might have to do something to, to amend that. Uh, galvanized steel is durable, lightweight, and there's plenty of preformed options that you can buy and just drop into place and get right to filling and gardening. Um, it's taste-based, it whether you think it's attractive or not. Some people like the industrial look. Some people, you know, they, they want something more rustic and wood. Um, the only real issues with galvanized steel are the potential for rust and bulging. If it's a weaker gauge steel and you've got a lot of soil, heavy soil in there, it can start to bow out over time and damaged galvanized steel does tend to rust fairly quickly. So that can become unsightly unless properly maintained. 
Um, another great option in this uh, sector is artificial wood. This has become more available uh, in the past few years, and there's a lot of composite, uh, you know, uh, kinds of plastic decking, recycled plastic composite lumbers. Finding something that's actually made from recycled plastic could be a very eco-friendly option for your garden. And they tend to be very durable, very rot proof, and they come in a wide range of colors. So you can really customize something that looks very nice for your landscape. Uh, they tend to be very heavy though, and uh, a little more expensive than wood. And because uh, they don't have the same sort of str linear strength that uh, wood traditionally does, you'll find that you need to put a couple extra supports mid-length to make sure that it's not bowing or wobbling as you put soil into it. Excuse me, Brendan, can I ask a couple questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, someone asked about um, using cinder block. What are your thoughts? Uh, of cinder block? Yeah, so cinder block is one that has an issue with uh, with lime leaching. It's you certainly can build a bed with it, but again, it's it's made of cement, and over time, that cement will leach into your soil. It will increase the pH of your soil, so you may find that down the road you need to add a sulfur amendment or something like that to help bring that pH back down. Okay. Also, um, someone also asked um, about. The safety of pressure treated lumber, and that is still kind of questionable. Um, can, you, can you still feel this way? I mean, I, I personally, you know, this is something that I've done a lot of reading into, um, and, and there certainly were periods of time, you know, go, going back 15, 20 years, that the chemicals that were being used in pressure treated were were really bad stuff. I mean, most of what's out there today, like I said, is micronized copper, and you can you can check the label on it, and that's you know, for for all intents and purposes compared to what it used to be, it's much safer. And I I personally use pressure treated in my garden. I don't feel that there's a risk with it. But if it's something that makes you uncomfortable, by all means, don't use it. There's plenty of other great options that you can turn to instead. Okay. That's it now. Okay. So anchoring is uh, uh, what I consider to be a fairly important element for raised beds, and uh, this you know this can be something of a choice that's that's uh, up to the builder. But uh, there's a few benefits to anchoring that I'll go over here. Um, first of all, anchors can consist of anything. I use white oak stakes for my anchors. Um, you know they're they're a durable hardwood. They're not going to rot that quickly. Uh, four by four posts, again, cedar or possibly treated, uh, galvanized poles, green U posts, just make sure that whatever you're using for your anchoring system is rot resistant because this will be in contact with, with soil and water and you need something that's not going to just deteriorate over the course of a couple of years. Um, so your anchoring system is going to hold your bed into pl in place. It helps retain its form against the pressure that the soil puts against the board, so having those mid-span supports can really be beneficial. And longer posts, like the one you see in the picture here, uh, this is my garden, and you know that gives you something to hang protective fencing on or to use for trellis netting. It gives you a little bit of extra utility. For lower beds, it's not super essential that you use um, these anchors. The bed will mostly stay in place, but again, it, you know, it, it can prevent a number of issues. Uh, for taller beds, especially ones that are kind of on the tall, thin side, I would definitely recommend that they're properly anchored. The extra weight of the soil can really cause the wood to pull apart over time. And just for safety, if it's anything that seems like it could topple over, you're definitely want, going to want to have that secured well into the ground. So as far as constructing the actual raised bed itself, um, you know, Depending on the materials you choose, there are many different methods, and there are many good plans available online. I mean, we, we could do an entire additional seminar and video series, and we might at some point, about actual building techniques and, and how to cut and form the wood. For the most part, if you're doing a wooden raised bed, you're going to follow a system like the one pictured here on the right-hand side. You cut your boards to size, put your anchor posts in, um, you know, lay out a line for and, and draw your perimeter, and then secure everything together. Some universal concerns, though, you know, even if you're using galvanized or landscape block, 
you're going to want to make sure that if your ground has any kind of significant slope, that you dig and level that off. That's to prevent rain from causing runoff in your garden. If, you're, if your raised bed is sloped downhill and we have a heavy rain, it's going to push all your soil right out of the top and make quite a mess. So make sure your beds are leveled. And uh, as far as actually installing the bed, you don't necessarily have to remove all the sod underneath, though you can. Um, laying down a layer of thick cardboard or newspaper at the bottom of your raised bed after you build it will kill off any weeds or grass that are down there. And this is actually uh, a mistake I made myself. I intended to do this and got so excited about building and filling my raised beds that I forgot about the cardboard part. So now I have weeds growing up through my soil. Um, I, I, make, I made plenty of mistakes. So. Uh, wire mesh in the bottom is another good thing to incorporate if you're worried about groundhogs and other burrowing, in, or, uh, yeah, burrowing animals, they'll prevent them from coming up through the bottom. So laying down that hardware cloth uh, on the bottom layer, that helps to keep your roots protected from any of those critters. So filling your raised beds. Um, this can be something of a tricky issue, and you want to be very careful about buying bagged and bulk soils because you don't really know what's going to be inside of them unless you've had a soil test. You know, plenty of soils at their source have lead in contaminants, and uh, there's been a real issue in the industry over the past few decades of soil and soil amendments being filled with what's called biosolids, which is a uh, a human waste byproduct that's derived from sewage treatment plants. It's used because it is full of nutrients, but it also tends to be full of heavy metals and possibly pharmaceutical byproducts and a lot of other things you just don't want to be, you know, eating when they uh, get taken up into your plants. So having a raised bed lets you have a custom mix that overcomes some of those issues. Um, it's a little more time intensive, but you know exactly what's going into your ground, and so you know exactly what's going into your plants. This includes peat, law, peat moss, uh, perlite, vermiculite, both of which are an expanded volcanic rock that uh, helps with, so with uh, grow mix texture and water retention. Uh, compost being incorporated, it's better to make your own compost. Again, uh, you have to be careful because some commercially available composts do come with biosolids. So making your own leaf compost and your own compost at home, that, that's generally the way to go. If you have good soil on location, if, you're, you know, if you've dug out a fire pit or somewhere to make a playground for your kids and you have the extra soil, Feel free to add that in and mix that in with your, with your peat moss and perlite. And uh, your fertilizer to make sure that your plants have the nutrients that they need. Um, filling the bottom of the raised beds, particularly with deeper raised beds so that you don't have to make too much of this fill. Um, you want to fill the bottom up with wood, leaf mulch, straw, newspaper, cardboard, and that reduces the overall amount mix that you need while incorporating things that will break down over time. Any questions? Yep, I have a few. Um, okay. Where to start? Oh, could you go back to the recommendations on size of the different race beds? People uh, are really certainly. interested in that. Yes. Oh, I think I, I think I might have accidentally skipped over a little of that. Okay. Do you want um, to discuss that, and then I'll go back to questions. Yeah. So yeah, let me let me. I think this is where you asked me questions, and I yeah. put myself off. Um, okay. Well, yeah. So for size of raised bed, sorry about that, folks. Um, minimum six inches is what you want to go with. Twelve is more ideal. It gives the roots uh, the room that they need to grow. Taller raised beds are good for accessibility, but require more fill. Um, the length and width that you end up choosing are up to you and the space that you have available. Um, but you want to consider trying to use common board lengths. If you're, if you're looking to minimize the amount of cutting and resizing that you have to do, keep in mind boards often come an 8-foot, 10-foot, 12-foot length. So if you build your sides with that in mind, then uh, you, you'll minimize the cuts that you have to make. As far as width, I will say that I personally am a big fan of 3-foot width. I've, I've done a few different size raised beds over the years, and I really like 3-foot. Uh, three feet wide for me is just enough for me be, to be able to reach the other side from where I am. So, you know, I don't, if I need to weed the bed, I can do it all by going down one side. 
I don't have to walk around the whole thing. It just makes everything a little bit more accessible, but what works for you is, is up to you. Um, were there more questions about this specifically? Not this, just about some materials. Um, one question was, what do you think about brick? I think brick's fine. Um, the the only it, uh, brick can be skill intensive, um, depending if if you're it, depending on how you want to hold it together. Um, it would be fine with landscape block. I don't see any particular problem with brick. I don't know of it having any issues with with soil leaching. But yes, if you feel inclined to uh, get artistic with brick, you could make some very lovely raised beds with that. Great. I think that's it for now. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about garden infrastructure. Um, these are some of my, my early lettuce coming up with my drip irrigation. Uh, this is my daughter, Sophia, uh, sur surveying the scene and uh, making sure that all her plants are okay. She's very, very protective of the plants. She got very upset when a groundhog got to the cabbages. So um, if you've grown a plant in New Jersey, then you certainly know that deer are a major problem that we have here. And dealing with them is one of the major challenges that both uh, farmers and home gardeners have to deal with. Uh, deer can jump eight feet in the air, they'll eat almost anything, and they are strong enough to break clean through weaker plastic mesh fencing. Um, if you're really looking to get serious about stopping deer, eight foot tall woven wire fence is considered to be the gold standard. Um, there's plenty of other options though, as that can be kind of expensive and, and skill intensive to build. Uh, chain link fencing that's tall will work too. Um, wooden fencing can be a very decorative solution, but again, you have to remember anything shorter than eight feet will deter deer in the short term, but if they get hungry and they will jump right over it and find your garden. Um, now, for smaller animals, they can be a little bit easier to deal with. Um, you know, things like rodents, uh, rabbits, groundhogs, chicken wire will mostly deal with those issues. If you're using chicken wire for protection, though, you do want to make sure that you secure that bottom edge, either by burying it six inches into the dirt or by fastening it onto the raised bed itself, because most of those small critters can burrow and they will climb right in underneath and, and still make a mess of your so I have a couple uh, video segments throughout this, and that brings us to the first one where I'm going to demonstrate uh, my chicken wire protection that I have set up on my garden, as well as introduce drip irrigation, which is going to be our next topic, and show just how easy it can be to, to use those systems. So here we go. So a couple important pieces of infrastructure that I use with my raised bed garden are chicken wire and drip irrigation. Chicken wire is great for protecting your plants from small animals like groundhogs or rabbits that could cause significant damage to the crops that you've planted. Uh, when installing chicken wire, it's fairly easy and inexpensive to do. A uh, simple power stapler or a heavy duty stapler will secure this to any posts that you have. When you're putting it up, make sure that you staple along the base as well, as those small animals can easily get in underneath and still do some damage to your plants. Drip irrigation is a great way to get water to your plants without getting them wet. And keeping your plants dry throughout the year can actually do a lot to prevent diseases. My drip irrigation is currently disconnected because of the amount of rain that we've been having, but I'm going to show you just how easy it is to work with one of these systems. Most of what you need to set this up is going to come with drip irrigation kits that are marketed specifically to home gardeners. You can find a lot of these online on different sites. They come with a pressure regulator to make sure that the water that's coming directly from your hose is at the right pressure. And everything is just these small screw-on fittings. All you have to do is unscrew that, slip off one tube, and slide the fitting into the other. A quick screw back on and your irrigation is set up and ready to go. It's that easy to incorporate drip irrigation into your home garden. Okay. So, um, as I said, you know, many of these systems are specifically targeted now for home gardeners. You can find these kits on a lot of your, your online gardening sites that come with everything that you need all ready to go. You just have to hook it up and run. Um, 
there's a lot of advantages to drip irrigation, and it's fairly easy to work with. It's not it's not an intimidating thing, and it can really make your gardening a lot more enjoyable. Uh, by directing water directly to the plant roots, you're first of all going to save water as opposed to go, uh, as opposed to uh, spraying water from overhead. It keeps the leaves dry, reducing diseases. And in combination with a well-drained raised bed, it makes it very difficult to overwater. And I can say this from experience because I have forgotten to turn off my drip irrigation at night. And uh, it's slow enough that the water has time to drain out and you don't necessarily end up with a waterlogged bed in the morning, which uh, is a real lifesaver when you are a forgetful gardener. It's also a very good time saver, um, just being, especially as your garden gets larger, just being able to go out and turn on the irrigation, let it go for a couple hours, um, makes a real big difference. You know, then when it, you set a timer on your phone, when you're done, you turn it off and, you know, you don't have to stand out there for a half hour, 45 minutes and water all the plants. And um, there's a lot of automated systems and technology that you can get into with drip irrigation. I'm going to talk about a little bit and uh, makes it real easy for more forgetful gardeners to take care of their plants. So some of the upgrades that are available on the market for drip irrigation include fertilizer injectors, uh, which are great if you want to deliver liquid fertilizer to your plant. It will inject it right into the hose. It'll go right out through the drip line. That means targeted delivery, less fertilizer wasted, and uh, just more efficient money savings overall. The only thing you have to be careful of with this is if you're using a liquid fertilizer that has a lot of sediments, as that might clog the emitters uh, on your drip line. So make sure that you're definitely using uh, a truly liquid fertilizer for that kind of system. Hose-mounted water timers are a great device that you can use to really take, uh, you know, take even more of the pressure of when to water and when to turn on and off off of your shoulders. Uh, you simply hook up one of these automated timers to your hose and you can set the length of time per day that you want it to water. Uh, if it's a rainy day, you can press the cancel water button and it won't, it just won't run that day. To get even more precise, a soil moisture sensor will eliminate the guesswork entirely. Uh, putting that probe into the ground will tell you exactly when your plants need water. And you can, again, set up those systems to be automated so your plants will only be watered when they actually need it. So again, with these kind of systems, there's, there's a lot of fun technology out there. And if you're a tinkerer and you like to experiment with some of these devices, you can do a lot to automate your garden and have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, any questions about the irrigation or chicken wire? I saw a few popping up. Someone asked about the recommended height of chicken wire. Recommended height um, for if you're only using chicken wire to deter smaller uh, vermin and groundhogs, then you know two foot high is high enough. Uh, the, a lot of those things aren't really going to jump over. But if you want to go three or four uh, for good measure, you can. If you're Doing a straight line fence, like at ground level, I would get three foot chicken wire and then bury the bottom six inches along your fence so that they uh, prevent the, any critters from being able to burrow underneath. Okay. Uh, one person asked, are you using a soaker hose or emitter? I, yeah, so soaker hose is another great option. There's a lot of good soaker hose kits out there, uh, again, for home gardeners. I'm using drip line, and you can actually see it much better in this picture. Um, you can see the emitters that are on there, and it's basically about every foot of line, just a short trickle of water comes out. And the thing I like about the drip line is the versatility of the system, because you, you transition from your hose through that pressure regulator, and then you can set this system off with branching lines that go to different beds. So you can have one main line, that goes along the end of your garden and then just lines that shoot off every few feet to keep everything nice and watered. And again, it's all controlled from, from one centralized location. Okay, do you wanna um, talk on using rain barrel water for irrigation? So rain barrel water, um, I actually, I, I plan to get a rain barrel and use it for some of my watering, but rain barrel irrigation will not 
necessarily uh, mesh well with the drip line, again, because rainwater, especially coming off your roof, can be heavy in sediments, and uh, those sediments can easily clog the emitters. If you have a, a filtering capability, if you can hook up to your rain barrel, something that uh, will, will you know, filter out those sediments as it collects, then that can be, an app, that can be a great option if you can get the pressure that you need. Uh, that's the other issue too. Is you know, these these systems run off being fully pressurized, so the water pressure from your house will fill all the lines and they'll slowly trickle out. It's tough to get that level of pressure from from a rain barrel for this type of system, but there are certainly other options that you can think. Of. And there's a lot of squirrel questions. Do you have any experience with uh, squirrels in the garden? I do. Um, yeah, squirrels. Yeah, I, I, I discovered um, this year in particular that uh, squirrels had apparently buried uh, plenty of food underneath where I set up my raised bed, so I did have a few issues early on. Um, my yard is kind of a squirrel haven, so honestly, um, other than entirely enclosing the area, you could put an extra roll of chicken wire over the top, but then you're going to need a way to ex access it. Uh, I sort of just tolerate the squirrels. If anyone has a good solution for squirrels in gardens, though, I, I would be glad to hear it because uh, I, I haven't yet. Okay. That's it. Brendan, the only way that uh, we've seen to keep squirrels out is, like you said, using chicken wire and using support structures. And in the case, if you're using the chicken wire around tomatoes or pepper plants, um, you could go ahead and put the chicken wire around and then remove it when you get ready to harvest. You can actually create a, a an outer cage of chicken wire and an internal cage that you normally use supports the tomato yeah. and tie that into place and then remove it when you want to harvest. Um, and that's the only surefire way to really keep squirrels out is, is to have that secondary chicken wire fence around some of the vegetables. Yep. Yeah, they, uh, yeah they're tricky. Okay, so. Now we're going to move into the fun part, uh, which is season extension. And this is, this is really my favorite thing right now um, that I'm experimenting with as a gardener, is um, not, not having to limit my gardening to when the frost dates say I can garden. And so the main principles that kind of cover season extension are this game of degrees, as I call it. So you have you know, frost and freeze damage to any plant is driven by temperature and duration, how cold it gets and for how long it gets that cold. A few extra degrees, just bringing your temperature of your plant up, you know, two, three degrees can sometimes make the difference and, and reducing that time. So if it's 32 degrees for an hour instead of three hours, that can make the difference between, you know, losing all your plants and being just fine. And this is something we're gonna talk a little bit about because uh, we've We've got some, some frost warnings coming up very soon. Um, another element of season extension is, is selecting when and how you plant. Um, early and late plantings of cold hardy vegetables and succession plantings throughout the summer also will extend your growing and harvesting season, and we'll get a little more into that later on. But first of all, um, low tunnels and hoop houses. So I've got a couple videos that address this. Uh, this is a technique I use in my home garden. And uh, you'll, you'll see some of the success that I've had with it. So, and uh, I'm also going to demonstrate how to actually bend up materials to make your own hoop house. A number of season extension techniques commonly used by farmers have become far more accessible to home gardeners over the last few years. One good example of this is the low tunnel or hoop house. Using a system like this, you can get your plants into the ground much earlier than you normally would. I've had tomatoes inside this one since April 1st, and in spite of a few frosty nights, they've held up very well. Now on a very sunny day like today, you might actually have to worry about it getting too hot inside, but don't worry, that's easy to take care of. With this design, all you have to do is lift up the corners and clip them off. Now your plants have room to breathe. I keep track of the temperature inside mine using a Bluetooth thermometer. This hooks up directly to my phone and will issue me an alert if it ever gets too hot inside of the tunnel. And as you can see, my tomato plants are already 18 inches tall in some cases. I'll have tomatoes by June. Another method of low tunnel that I use is this one over here. It's 
the same basic principle, keeps the plants protected at night, but for a larger bed like this, it allows me easier access if I need to weed or harvest what's inside. A couple of hinges are installed on the back along the raised bed. Let me lift this up and put it down as needed. These systems are incredibly easy to put together. You can bend your own hoops using a bender like this, and the plastic comes on rolls that you can simply roll out and hook onto the frame. I'll show you how to bend up one of the hoops. So, uh, now I'm going to show you how to bend up a hoop for your hoop house. One of the first things you need to consider is the materials you're going to be using. I use half inch electrical conduit that you can get at your local home improvement store. This is 10 feet long and they come in those lengths. It's important to use the galvanized steel conduit instead of something like PVC. PVC can actually react with your plastic greenhouse film and cause it to degrade faster. For your greenhouse film, you can find this online. Uh, this roll came 10 foot wide by 100 feet long, and I use this to make both of my hoop houses so far, and there's enough left on the roll to probably make one or two more. My bender that I've used, I also purchased online. It's a little more expensive than some other garden equipment, but if you go in with maybe a few other gardening friends, it's about 60 bucks, so not too much of an investment. I've anchored mine to a stump that I have conveniently located in my garden, but a heavy picnic table or even a potting bench would work a little better and might mean a little less bending over when you're making these hoops. So I marked my hoop off at 16 inches, the halfway point of five feet, and 16 inches from the far end. First, I'm gonna line this up with the little hoop on my bender. Then, simply bend around until you touch on the far side. Pull that out, spin it around, and line it up to the other 16 inch mark. Again, pull around until the hoop touches the bender. Now to finish it off, you're just gonna line that halfway point mark up with the center bolt on your bender, and you're gonna give these a squeeze just until they're parallel. It's fairly easy to adjust this material. And there you go. You have your first hoop for your greenhouse. These will slide easily into the ground with a little bit of pressure, and then you just have to stretch your film across. Okay, so there's a little bit about uh, using low tunnels in your garden. Um, so one of the great things about this, uh, and you know, this a lot of this is about how to bring together these different techniques. So remember, if you're using these hoop houses, uh, the rain won't be reaching your plants, so drip irrigation combined with these kind of systems can make sure that you still get the water you need. Um, the fact that rain isn't reaching your plants is actually a bit of a bonus because, again, keeping water off plants is how we keep them healthy. Most plant diseases are driven by periods of moisture, so the less rain and water get on your plant, the better off you actually are. Um, so these are these hoop houses are also fantastic options for fall extension. So if you want to start planning now on what your fall garden is going to look like, consider incorporating low tunnels into that as well. They give you the poten potential even for year-round production of really cold hardy vegetables like kale or collards. Having those, those brassicas underneath a hoop house like this, unless you get a really cold, really, really cold frost, uh, they'll actually they'll, they'll stay healthy under there and you'll be able to continue to harvest them. Um, the plastic film that you want to use is not necessarily the same as what you would get at Home Depot as a painter's tarp. Um, you want to go with the stuff that's specifically sold as greenhouse film. Uh, that makes sure that it's got the best light penetration, that the plastic itself is UV resistant, and, the, and that's going to really increase its longevity because it's designed for this purpose. So that's inside one of my other... Uh, the, that's the one that flips up. And this is just an overview of how this system works. Um, so what you're going to want to do once you make your hoops up, you need a hoop in about every two feet. The last hoops on the end are going to be slid in at a 60 degree angle, and that helps with the tension of the whole system. Then you're going to gather and twist. You, you need to leave yourself a good amount of slack of greenhouse film off either end because you're going to gather and twist that up almost into a rope and then tie it around that stake, which then you're going to hammer in at an angle. And as you hammer the second stake in on the far end, you're going to see that it draws that whole system in tight and really stretches your plastic across the hoops. 
And I like to use logs to hold down the side of mine. It's really easy to roll them on and off with my foot and lift the side up and down when I need to. Uh, any, any questions uh, about that part before I go into a little uh, about the thermometers? Someone was asking about the uh, different vendors they sell for the electrical conduit. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there, at least what I've seen, there seems to be three different size benders. Um, I have the one that makes four foot hoops, so they're, they're four foot diameter across the midsection. There's also benders for three foot hoops and for six foot hoops, if you want to go with something larger. Um, four foot hoops works really well for me. Um, I did that because I was initially making these hoop houses for my four foot by eight foot raised bed, so I went with four foot. But yeah, they're all in the same about that sixty dollar price range. I think the the six foot one is maybe seventy or eighty. Um, someone asked about um, the irrigation lines freezing. Um, do you want to talk about maybe how um, you take them up in the winter and, and maybe yeah. short periods of freeze and um, yeah, if, the, uh, the water. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if if you're expecting there to be, you know, so so they don't stay under pressure when um, you know once the, once you turn off the water, they drain down pretty quickly. Um, but if you do anticipate that there's going to be a hard freeze, again, a light frost isn't too big a deal. But if it, if, if it's going to freeze significantly, then it would be good to disconnect the fittings and just lift from one end to try to drain the water out. Now, you know, from season to season, over winter, you definitely want to wrap these lines up and get them stored properly, make sure that they're drained out. And if you're using any kind of PVC to, to deliver water from one location to the other, uh, make sure that you empty that out as well and, and blow some air through it uh, so that it doesn't freeze over winter. And that's what a couple people asked about um, attaching the plastic to the hoop. Um, your method, you don't seem to use any attachments. Uh, the plastic to the hoop, but do you want to maybe talk about some other ways that yeah, the, uh, um, yeah. So there, there are there are a number of different ways that these hoop houses uh, can can be made. Uh, my method is just one: the combination of the tension that comes from the stakes, and if I pull up that side, the fact that there's the angled hoops will actually put more tension across the top of the system and help hold it in place when the side is lifted. So I haven't found a need. To, to actually fasten it on, but most of the retailers that sell the hoop vendors and the greenhouse film will also sell their, their kind of little like C-shaped plastic clips that will hook on there is one method. Uh, there's other methods that you can use um, doubled up uh, bungee cords to hold them down by making a, a loop on either side that the bungee cord can hook on to. Uh, there, yeah, there's a lot of different methods. I don't use a fastener. I haven't found the need to yet, but there's certainly ways to do that. And then last question. Um, did you mention the thickness of the plastic? Uh, the thickness of the plastic, I, off the top of my head, I actually can't say. I would have to look that up. But uh, yeah, we'll plastic, plastic is usually uh, six mil for greenhouses and for tunnels, it's about four mil. There you go. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Yeah, anything that's marketed as greenhouse film will generally fall between those uh, those parameters and will be what you're looking for. Okay, so um, again, you know, hoop houses offer an opportunity to get a little bit high tech with your system um, because, you know, like I said in the video, it's you're you're building that low tunnel to protect your plants from cold. Sure. But at the same time, on a sunny day, you could easily end up cooking your tomato plants in there. So I have what's pictured here, the little Govee sensor. That works well for me, but it's a Bluetooth sensor, so the range of it's pretty limited. If your garden's way out at the other end of your yard and fairly far away from the house, it might be too far away from you to, for you to get a signal. There's other systems out there that work really well. Um, and... You can, you know, that, that, that's another fun area to experiment with, and there's a lot of different levels of complexity, even up to this web-enabled system that I have pictured here. This can hook up to 12 different temperature sensors and plug into your local area network and can send you an email if it gets too hot, you know, but basically what, what I like about the system I have, you know, being close to my house, 
I can set that limit at 100 degrees, and the second that temperature hits that inside of my tunnel, I get an alert on my phone, I go right out and open it up so that I don't end up cooking my plants. Um, and a lot of these systems also, if you're, if you're into data, if you like looking at data over time, you can actually save the temperature data and you know, see how big a fluctuation you're getting between night and day inside of that. So floating row cover, uh, this I definitely want to address because this could be very important for this weekend. This is great to use in a pinch. Um, this material will save your plants. Again, if you're dealing with a borderline frost where you know it's forecast to be right around 31, 32 degrees, a floating row cover like this, or even similarly plastic sheeting if you really need to just get something on top of your plants, if, if you've already got tomatoes in the ground, I would highly recommend for this weekend and next week to cover them up at night. Uh, get, it, get some kind of row cover, plastic, even if it's just a plastic garbage bag you have to put over your container, it's going to get right to the edge of killing cold, and uh, it, it could be bad if you don't give your plants some sort of protection. Uh, these are nice. Uh, the, the row cover is nice in that you can leave it on. It allows sun and rain through and it will prevent uh, pests like cabbage moths and things like that from landing on your plants and doing damage to them. Just make sure that any plants that need to be pollinated are left open so that the, the, so that the good bugs can get to them. So early and late planting, uh, don't, let your, don't let your gardening be defined by frost dates. And I've got one last video to show that talks a little bit about what I've got going on uh, with early and late. So here we have a few examples of plants that you can already have in the ground growing in April and have your first harvests before we even get to the frost date. Uh, on my left, we have lettuce, spinach, kale, and broccoli down at the end of the row. Um, part of this was started as transplants indoors, and then when those transplants were planted out, more was direct seeded. That gives us a succession of plantings. That means even after the first plants start to run out of steam, we'll still have more that we can continue to harvest until it gets too hot for these to grow anymore. Uh, another great cold weather crop is cabbage. Uh, this won't grow once we get to the heat of the summer, um, but it's good to have in in April and even early as late March. Uh, the row cover that you see me with over here is to keep out cabbage moth. If you see those white moths flying around, they can lay eggs on the cabbage, which can do some really serious damage to the crop. So it's best to keep them protected throughout their growing season. Uh, another great early spring crop are peas. Uh, these are climbing peas, both sugar snap and English peas. These will climb up the trellis and get at least six feet high, and you'll be able to pick those again until the weather gets very hot. So uh, again, so for early and late planting, a few things to consider. Um, you, can, you can get started well before the frost date, and you can keep growing well after the first frost date in October by picking vegetables that simply don't mind the frost. Brassicas, the, the brassica family of vegetables is a big one for this. Kale, cabbage, broccoli, and collards are very, very cold tolerant. Some greens, such as spinach and lettuce, are moderately tolerant. You can get those started in April, no problem. I've had mine out there for weeks. They've survived multiple frost nights at this point. And the peas, uh, get them growing up a trellis, and you'll, you'll have a really good harvest of peas you know, by the time you get into May, late May, early June. Um, so starting from, so tricks to these, of course, uh, you want to start from seed in February or March, and then again in August or September. Um, it's important to start from seed and have transplants for your fall crops because a lot of these crops that like the cold weather, their seeds won't germinate if you stick them directly into the ground. So if you try to direct seed spinach, say, in August, it's way too hot and the seeds will go dormant. Um, but if you start those plants inside and then get them planted out into the ground in September, you're going to have some really great spinach come October. Um, and then plant, you know, there's other crops as well that you can plant to overwinter and get a jump on next year. Garlic and strawberries are examples of plants that can survive overwinter, and uh, then they'll come up early in the spring and you'll get a jump on your harvest because as soon as they're ready to start growing, they'll, they'll be off and you'll, you'll be the first one with strawberries on your block. 
So here's just a few things to show you. Uh, we've already been picking from the garden a few times. We've got lettuce and spinach already coming in. We did uh, some sauteed spinach the other night that was buttery and delicious. Uh, this lettuce that we picked is a butterhead lettuce that um, my wife, who doesn't even like lettuce, was eating it raw out of the colander like it was potato chips. She loved it so much. And uh, just as a little last element, um, I want to talk a little bit about succession planting. So I'm sure, uh, like me, most gardeners have had the experience of having all of your vegetables suddenly come in all at once, and you've got way more than you can eat for a week or two, and then suddenly everything stops. Um, in that, in, if that's your experience, or you've had that experience, if that sounds familiar, then consider succession planting. Uh, leaving open spots for future plantings. Uh, so don't plant out every square foot of your garden all at once. I know it takes some self-control. It's tough for me to not put a plant everywhere that I can. Um, plant smaller amounts of each variety. If you do two to three weeks between things, um, then you, you know, the next one will be starting to produce as the last one's running out of steam. Replant areas that are spent or already harvested. If you've picked out all your lettuce, or your spinach is bolted, go ahead and put in tomatoes or squash where that was growing and keep using that garden space throughout the rest of the summer. And when you're planning your successions out, you want to work backwards from the last frost date. If something takes 70 days to maturity, you don't want to plant it 60 days from, from the first frost date in October, or you run a risk never getting a harvest out of it. So count backwards and then add a week or two and, you know, so set, go 70 days back from October 15th, add a couple weeks onto that, and that's when you're going to want your last planting to be. Um, for those who are just getting started with succession planting, is, there's plenty of time to get into it and try it this year. Start with greens. Uh, if you've already got lettuce or spinach out there, try, you know, put in another planting of those, and then when they come out, replant with something else. And then try summer veggies. Uh, squash and determinate tomatoes are great candidates for succession planting. If you plant uh, new squash every three weeks or so, as one plant starts to run out, your next one will just be starting to come online and you can have a nice consistent harvest throughout the summer. So in conclusion, uh, many of these techniques are really about putting a little more planning and upfront work in, in exchange for better control, higher yields, and a longer period of harvest. Uh, taken all together, you're going to create an integrated garden system that really lets you get the most out of the growing space that you have. And if you start planning your successions and fall plantings now and try to incorporate some of the techniques I talked about here tonight, you'll find that you can uh, really extend how long you can garden for and maybe even keep gardening and, and make it a year-round hobby. And thank you for your time. <laughs> So uh, here's our, our final slide, and uh, I'm going to turn things over now to uh, Bill Lubick, and thanks again to our freeholders in Middlesex County and uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension for making this possible. Have a good night, everybody. Unless there's more questions, I'll take those now. Yeah, actually, why don't we take some questions right now? Yeah, go ahead. Can you um, also talk about the Bluetooth sensor, the name of that? Oh, yes. So the system I used was Govi. Um, you know, I can't say it's the best system on the market because it's the first one I found and bought, but I, I purchased it because it was only about 12 or $13 for the sensor. The app is free for your phone and you, you pair it Bluetooth wise. And that's a, that's G O V E E. But there's a lot of other systems out there and I encourage anyone who wants to try to experiment. There's ones that have longer range and better data collection and there that's that's a real fun area to that you can mess around in. Okay. Everyone's asking about the uh succession spreadsheet. Um are you gonna be able to make that available? I will, in the interest of full disclosure, this is not my spreadsheet. This is a very helpful spreadsheet that I found online, but uh if the, uh, I, I believe, are these slides being made available to registered attendees? Yes, the slides are going to be, the presentation itself is going to be online, and we're going to post that on our county website. Yes, and what you see on this, on this spreadsheet is absolutely, I mean, you, you can definitely use this in, in your home garden with, with a little modification. And again, I encourage people to take notes and experiment, you know, try, try different things, different years. Sometimes things, something might work out great. 
And other times, you know, it, it just might not work for you. Make a note and try something different the next time. Do you, uh, do you have any experience with squash vine borers? Squash vine borers, yes. So um, my squash, as it comes in, I will be using row cover on that as well, up until the point where the second blossoms come in and then you really need pollinators in there. Um, squash vine borer has their, their laying season tends to be in May and I believe early June. So uh, one trick that I've heard recommended if you wanted to lay planting your squash into later in June or the beginning of July, you can avoid their laying cycle altogether. Uh, but again, uh, doing a floating row cover and just making sure that it's secured down around the edges up until you actually need to uncover them. Can, uh, can prevent the borers from getting to the squash plants. Anything else? Sorry, I was muted. Oh, okay. Um, do, you have any <laughs> do you have any recommendations on trellising? On trellising? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I... Trellising is a tricky, so trellising is something that I'm experimenting with myself. Um, there's a lot of great trellis netting products out there, and I would say, you know, probably the best solution is, is to purchase, you know, one of those official trellis netting products and set it up as recommended. I experimented around with the tower that you see in my garden because I happen to have some extra fencing and two-by-fours laying around. And, you know, that in itself is an experiment. So, you know, but I, I would very much recommend for, you know, using trellis for climbing plants, you know, using it for your cucumbers, using it for your peas, uh, staking your tomatoes. Um, I, you know, I'm going to be trying to do the, uh, the, the Florida, it's called the Florida wrap. It's the stake and weave method. Um, for longer rows of tomatoes, but yeah, there's different ways to stake I, it. That, you could you could probably uh, you could probably start many heated arguments online recommending the the correct ways to trellis or or stake garden plants. Okay. Um, someone also asked about the uh, floating row cover. Yes. And uh, specifics on that. What about specifically? Uh, just um, sorry, I can't see what it was. Uh, I guess brand type. Anything you recommend? Uh, Bill, do you have any specific uh, brand recommendations for, for floating row cover? Might be okay. Hello there. Um, hey. most of the floating row covers you see available out there are usually about, the, when, when you look online, you'll see they're anywhere from two to four mil in thickness. And you want something that adequately will let light in, uh, but you know not be so heavy that the plant that you need to support them. Uh, depending on what you put floating row cover on, will actually depend on um, whether the plant has support around it. If it's a plant that's fl in flower and you have the heavy row, a heavier row cover on it, you could actually do some damage to the plant. So just having support structure around it is wise. Um, we don't have any specific brands that we recommend only because we don't support one particular company, but if you look online um, or you go to one of the garden stores, they will have floating row cover available. And and they do call it floating, but I I honestly, for especially for lower stuff like the cabbages, at least at this point, I like to bury the edges of it because it'll float right away and end up in my neighbor's yard if I leave it free floating. You, you actually um, have to secure the edges of it, so you want to put weights on the edge. We use uh, row covers for strawberries when we're doing uh, protecting strawberries in the off-season. Uh, yeah. So it's important that um, you put it on when you need it, but then also you remove it when you don't need it because we don't want to encourage uh, excessive growth, especially with something like strawberries, because we encourage too many flowers early in the season. They can actually be damaged by the cold, so you, know, you need to know when to take it off. Yeah, and that is a good point, too, is that, you know, those, those extra couple degrees that it brings can really speed up growth of certain things. and Sometimes you don't necessarily want that. Now, we're right at 730, so why don't we just take some uh, – do you have more questions there, Angela, we can take? Um, 
Bill, do you want to talk about strawberries? Someone asked if they should cover the blossoming of strawberries this weekend. Um, yeah, you could cover the strawberries, especially um, the temperatures that we're going to see uh, in the next two to three days. I would highly recommend covering the berries just to protect them. Um, with especially in a small garden area, it's easy enough to do. Um, you can cover them with the row covers and then just put weights on each side so that that doesn't blow off. Um, and we can usually get two or three grains out of a, a row cover to protect those strawberries. Um, and typically you can tell whether strawberry flowers have been damaged because you'll see the very center of the strawberry itself will start to turn brown. Okay, um, someone is having an issue with grubs using their seedlings. Um, and it seems to happen to them every year. Um, typically grubs, grubs come in, um, the white grub complex, She's come in where you've had uh, grasses, uh, anything in the graminate family, because they tend to be a problem. It, typically, grubs are not a problem in regular garden areas. It's when you turn from uh, sod or turf grass into uh, an area where you're going to produce vegetables. So they could be other problems uh, occurring in there. They could be rootworms or, or other types of invaders that are causing problems within the garden. So you got to look a little bit closer. Um, to see what's actually causing the problem. Okay, um, what would you uh, plant next? Um, example, if I'm growing beets, then should I grow spinach next? I guess it's just for, uh, referring to a rotation cropping. Yeah, like, oh, the, like the, the succession in place? Yep. Yeah, so beets, um, so beets are going to, they're, they're going to, be growing in that area probably until June. And uh, by that point, it's going to be starting to get too hot for spinach. So if you want to, once you pull out your beets, um, start looking towards something maybe more that you want for the fall. Uh, putting in, uh, you know, if you, if, if you want butternut squash for the fall, could be a good option, or even turning that area into into peppers or something or a second succession of your summer squash. Um, but yeah, something like spinach is by the time it has a chance to really take off, it's going to be too hot and it'll fall. Okay. Um, someone else asked about their fig tree, if they should cover their fig tree this, uh, this weekend as well. I'm, I guess I, I don't, I, I will full disclosure. I mean, and Bill, do you, do you know much about fig? I would assume if it's a flowering fruit tree, it should probably be protected. If, if the tree, um, if the tree has been out, is it in a container? I, I guess, um, yeah, we're not able to talk to the person, but if it's been in a container, then you would want to protect it or, or yeah, the row cover is not going to hurt the fig tree. Um, yeah, if it can be moved and you can bring it in. then I Right. Yeah, if you can, any plant that, that that's why we, uh, last week we were talking about uh, using simple five-gallon bucket containers to grow some of your vegetables, because many people don't have the capacity, a uh, large area to have a raised bed or to garden in, or they may not have sunlight in an area where they would want to set up a raised bed. So in those cases, um, we are going to go over um, in one of our future lectures how to make a, um, a very simple uh, rate uh, using several buckets just to make a, a simple planter using two five-gallon buckets and making sure that we have proper drainage. Any other questions, Angela? You see I'm there? looking, I'm looking. Okay. Uh, I think um, somebody was asking about at one time uh, animals burrowing underneath. Yep. Uh, Any, I, one here is a suggestion for bull or groundhog management. Yes, groundhog management is, um, I don't know if I can share here because I've got a good slide for protecting. Dave, are you there? Can you? Um, yeah, you know, why don't I, let me back out and uh, I can. Uh, I can you turn it over to me. I, I've got over. a couple of slides. In this. Okay. Let's okay, see. Bill, you should be ready to go. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting there. Yeah, okay. So that's your job. Yep, you, you are a presenter now. So I'm going to turn okay. off the camera. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. Okay, it's loading. Can you guys see that? 
Yep. Easy to grow. Okay, here we go. Trying to advance the slides here. It's not uh, too well. Let me see here. Dave, can you advance from that end? Or it doesn't seem to want to advance for me. Hold on a second. Do you, there, yeah, there's a little bar okay. on the side. Now, yeah. now it's going. Okay. So um, people were asking about protecting from groundhogs. And at our local community garden, as you can see here, can everybody see this? Is it showing up, Brendan? Okay, you can see that what we did here use the tubing for that we typically use for drainage. You can buy this type of tubing in any home improvement store, and you simply cut a slit in that tubing and put it on the top of your garden fence. And that prevents groundhogs and other animals from actually climbing over areas and getting into your garden, because they actually will hit that area and slide right back down again. Um, some people will actually put a, a fence that flops down on the top of that as well as if they don't have these tubes and the animal or groundhog or whatever tries to climb over, that fence will flop down. Another thing that we do at the base of our garden fence is to secure, uh, either put stone down or put cinder blocks at the base, um, but also use a tightly woven wire like chicken wire at the base. And it's, it's wise to use a plastic coated chicken wire if possible because it's going to last a lot longer. It's not going to rust. And you would actually take that chicken wire, bury that a foot into the ground, and you can even angle the bottom portion of that outwards at a 45 degree angle under the ground so the groundhogs can't climb underneath that fence and cause damage to your plants. And that's typically what we do in many of our community gardens is we actually bury chicken, um, yeah, chicken wire down into the ground uh, and, and then angle that wire out uh, away from the actual fence itself. Um, so these are some methods that do work and can keep groundhogs and other animals out of your garden. By having a, a tighter woven fence uh, like chicken wire at the base of the fence, at least for a foot or two feet up, that will keep a lot of the smaller animals out of your garden. And you have to have that same wire where you have your gates uh, to protect the entire area of the garden. Any questions on that, Angela? See anything? So here you see on one side of the garden where we have um, you know, one simple way that they used to protect it because they didn't <clears throat> have an opportunity to go in and bury the fences. They put cinder blocks, other blocks along the fence and that kept animals uh, from going into the base and, and trying to dig under. And if you can dig down a little bit and put the block into the ground, that'll actually protect uh, uh, that garden and, and keep groundhogs from actually burrowing into your garden. Um, any questions on that? And I just want to visit out to uh, crop that's coming up right now, and it's uh, all across New Jersey. Asparagus is coming in. And um, these are some asparagus fields that we have uh, 10 minutes away from where I live here in central New Jersey. And asparagus now is, you're gonna see it at many of your local farm markets. And I encourage you to go out and support our local farm markets as much as possible. Um, we have asparagus and greens coming in and other vegetables are, are uh, all throughout the state. And many of our marketers now are providing new methods to uh, order online and pick up your produce that's already boxed for you. So there's an opportunity there to provide uh, extra level of safety for you when you're going out and, and purchasing from our local farmers. So it's um, very important to support our local farmers. When we go out and cut asparagus, we use these asparagus knives. There's just a little knife with a V in it. We Go out and we'll cut the asparagus right below the soil line so that the asparagus will heal back up again. And um, at, towards the end of the season, we actually let some of those uh, spears actually grow into a, a much larger fern-like plant. And that's what provides the energy so that the next season um, we'll actually have these spears coming up again in the spring. The asparagus is um, one of our first crops besides greens and some other vegetables that we'll get very early in the season. Uh, unless you have a lot of space, it's, it's tough for you to grow asparagus, so you may want to leave that to 
the farmers and people that have a lot more space than we typically do in our backyards. Um, typically about a handful of asparagus is what you need for about two people. And the wise thing when you're harvesting any of these crops is to make sure you don't overcook it. Um, steaming vegetables is always a, a great idea. And you just want to steam them to the point where you can stick a fork in that and the fork, it's tender enough where that fork will pass through the asparagus and then turn the heat off. Um, and it's just wonderful to get fresh asparagus out there at this point. So that's a, that's a great crop that's available right now. Um, just want to show a few other things that are, these are actually some plants that were from last year that we put in the fields. And this is kale on the left-hand side, and we let kale continue to grow. It actually starts to flower this time of the year. And if you look a little bit closer, let's see if we can, next slide. It actually produces these buds, and you can actually even go out and harvest these young buds. Um, and here you see them on a colander on the right side and harvest those, and you can steam those, uh, cook those up. Um, excellent uh, flavor there, they're very sweet. Uh, so that's something that you may want to try. Um, and Brandon was talking about hardening off plants, which is really important. What I'd recommend is if, if you haven't planted already, you might want to hold off at least until uh, next week to put in uh, many of your vegetable plants because it's going to get pretty cold out there in the next couple of days. So you want to make sure that you're protecting your plants as much as you possibly can. Um, so it's a good idea to, uh, you know, if you can – Use the row covers, as we were talking about earlier, or you can put a bucket over tomatoes or peppers if you already have them planted outside. Um, if you have plants that are in containers, you can bring them in a protected area. Um, when we have nights where it's going to get down, you know, close to 32 degrees, 34, I think, was predicted for this week, um, you really want to protect those sensitive plants, especially the solanaceous plants like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. Tomatoes are more resilient than peppers and eggplants, um, but you still want to protect those tomatoes. And then the hardening off process simply means that when you're putting plants out uh, from the greenhouse or plants that you just recently purchased or you're bringing up from your area where you started the seedlings, um, you want to set them out and gradually expose them to more light um, to direct sunlight. So you may have put them out for a half hour one day and then the next day for an hour uh, the following day, maybe two hours, uh, and then after about 10 days to 14 days, then those plants would be ready to plant in the garden. And just a couple of uh, plants that are easy to grow, but we want to wait until it's warm before we actually put these plants outside. Uh, basil is one of the uh, is just a, a wonderful plant to grow. You don't have to have a lot of basil, but it's wonderful to have fresh basil. There's a new Basil coming out of Rutgers University that um, Dr. Ben Simon just developed called Devotion, and there's one called Obsession, uh, and they're terrific varieties because they have a lot of disease resistance. Uh, and basil, easy crop to grow. You don't need big containers to grow it, so no matter what size garden or pot you have, you can get that started, and even um, you, you could grow it in full sun to even partial uh, shade areas, and it's going to do fine in those areas. I'm going to give you a good crop. You just want to make sure that you have adequate drainage for basil, because if you don't have adequate drainage, you're going to have problems with water logging uh, with basil, and you can have uh, some basil rot on that. So it's, it's careful. Uh, be very careful to make sure you have adequate drainage for basil. Uh, another thing that's very easy to grow for beginner gardeners is different types of mint, but you do have to contain mint because it'll quickly take over an area. So if you grow mint in pots, uh, in containers, um, and make sure that, um, uh, you know, you're protecting it from spreading all throughout your garden because it can quickly take over areas. Um, but that's an easy crop for beginner gardeners to grow, and there's so many different types out there, from pineapple mint to chocolate mint uh, to... Uh, so that there's, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of different... Um, uh, types of mint that you can try. And anis hyssop is another great plant to have in your garden um, because the, the anise actually will attract a lot of beneficial insects that will help to protect your garden plants. So it, uh, anise itself is a great plant to have as an herb. Uh, it has a licorice type flavor to it and smell. 
but it's also great because it attracts uh, pollinators and other beneficial insects that are going to help to reduce more problematic um, insects that can attack our other garden plants. Another great plant to uh, have in your garden is bronze fennel. Uh, bronze fennel, we found in research and work that we did years ago, was one of the best plants to have in a garden to attract a, a very diverse group of pollinators um, and insects that were very protective to our garden. So, uh, it, you know, if you're going to plant a couple plants, as we said, with the fennel and the anise, these would be wonderful plants to attract um, beneficial insects into our garden. Uh, the bronze fennel will come back and produce seeds, and you'll see a lot of plants coming up the next year, so you do have to keep an eye on it and make sure that it doesn't uh, take over some garden areas with uh, all the seed it produces. But the bronze fennel actually is very good uh, to use in cooking. Uh, it has a licorice flavor, and when it produces the small buds, if you ever have a stomach ache, you just crushing a few of these buds in your mouth can actually um, really cure a stomach ache. It's amazing how fast this works, and you can also use the, the buds and the leaves to flavor a lot of your dishes, and it's just a great plant all around. Any questions on anything that we talked about today? Well, so, um, I have a couple questions here. Um, people were asking about covering their blueberry bushes. Blueberry bushes. So blueberries, um, yeah, they're, right now they're in different stages depending on where you are in the state. You could cover them if you have the capacity to do that, to protect them depending on what stage they're at with the flowering and, uh, you know, but it, it's not going to hurt them to cover them. So you can do that. You could actually tie a row cover right around them um, and just attach that with a string and that will provide um, at least uh, two to three degrees protection for those plants. Any other questions? Um, one person was asking about uh, when should they stop picking the suckers off of the tomato plants? Okay, so the suckers on tomato plants, what we typically will do is when we're trying to train tomatoes, um, you know, we'll have one central leader, or maybe two, two plants, depending on whether or not we're growing them in cages or not. Um, and we'll remove at least the bottom two suckers on the tomato plant. And once we get the plant trained within the cage to where we want it um, with one or two liters, then we want to make sure that we're supporting those plants properly within that container. But you never want to just keep pruning all the way up. And you, especially if there, if there is a flower of, um, that's going to turn into a fruit, of course, we want to go um, two, um, actually, yes, we're going to go two branches below that, before, um, prune below, but never... The, the branch before. You don't want to prune that sucker right below the fruiting branch because if you do, then your production will decrease significantly. So you always want to stay uh, two suckers below the uh, actual tomato formation, a tomato flower. Another question was um, about someone who's trying to plant asparagus, but uh, each year uh, they let it go for two years and then the plant dies. Um, they have a sandy, sorry, sandy, um, sandy soil, pH is 6.5, and it's in a, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find it, uh, a raised bed with a no dig garden, and it's topped off with half an inch of compost in the fall. Do, okay. uh, any... do, do they know what variety of asparagus? Um, because the older asparagus um, are very susceptible to disease where our newer varieties um, that we put out uh, actually through Rutgers University some time ago, the all-male uh, hybrid varieties, are actually resistant to disease. So if they are using older varieties, that could be part of the problem that those varieties are, are just very susceptible to some of the diseases that will uh, attack asparagus. Also, asparagus needs uh, proper drainage, but it also needs moisture availability. So the best way to grow asparagus is to make sure that you mix organic material into the soil, um, but there's adequate drainage of that soil. Now, it sounds like if they're growing it on sand, that shouldn't be a problem, but there may need to be a little bit of organic matter because maybe that area could be um, potentially either drying out or 
um, not able to hold enough nutrients or moisture around that plant. So it could be one of those two extremes. So typically with any plant where you're having a problem like that, you want to add organics. Um, you can set up raised beds so that they can drain properly. But by adding compost or peat moss, you can establish a situation where those plants are going to flourish and excess water will drain off of the area as well. Okay, it seems like it was uh, an heirloom variety, so I think that maybe answers Yes, so heirloom variety, you know, yeah, great. So that's, that's good. Yeah. So heirloom varieties in general, um, not always, but in general, heirloom varieties are going to be more susceptible to disease problems. Um, it depends on the particular heirloom, heirloom that's in question. Um, so, and then the longer that if you have not rotated a specific crop out of an area, then there's a, a greater chance that you're going to have diseases build up within that particular uh, section of the garden. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, great. So uh, I want to thank Brendan Pearsall for and today. Brendan, you did a great what? job. I really appreciate you coming on Are You Ready to Garden this week. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun this week. Um, next week, we have, um, Bill Erickson is going to be on talking about fascinating plants uh, in edible landscaping. So he's going to tell you how to use some really colorful and beautiful plants with okay. the landscape. So you'll want to join us uh, next week, week for that. Uh, we're going to be on at Thursday through the next month and a half uh, at 6.30. And we welcome you to join us and, and uh, invite your friends as well to come on. And Dave, and we, and talk we about also it. have the Earth Day at Home series videos. Yes, that's a great video. Check out from our Rutgers Environmental Stewards. Uh, they're they're on Mondays at six thirty, and there's a little tiny URL you can dip into your browser to get access to our Environmental Stewards for their Monday night show. That's tinyurl.com. Earth Day at Home. Uh, also, our local 4-H department has some presentations coming up as well. If you want to find out about 4-H for your kids and your family, do the, the, uh, go to the address tinyurl.com 4-H presents, and you can see their schedule. And what else do we have? Everyone see the Helpline Live information? My, yep. Uh, What's up? Yep. Hey, every Wednesday, every Wednesday, just to let everybody know, if you have gardening questions, you can join us on our helpline live, um, and you can email our master gardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us if you have questions. Um, we have a team of wonderful master gardeners that are there to help answer questions throughout the week, and the helpline live is on every Wednesday at 10. A. So make sure that. Um, you join us next time, and especially next week. Um, uh, we're we're going to be on every Thursday uh, at 6.30, and we'd love to see you again. And to, to make sure you get invited, just visit tinyurl.com, Middlesex County Grows, which brings you to our county webpage, and uh, there'll be a button there to that you'll click and get that email invite to the program. We'll probably invite you anyway, but uh, just share it with your friends. To get to tinyurl.com slash Middlesex County Grows. And you can also email our master gardeners with your address with ConCon as the subject. And we'll make sure you get on our constant contact emailing list for all our programs. That's going to be it for us. I want to thank Brendan Pearsall, a speaker today, and Angela Monahan for helping out and fielding questions, and our engineer, Dave Smella. And we look forward to uh, seeing you next time on Are You Ready to Garden?